Okay, thank you. Um, <coughs> nuclear fusion is the source. Can you hear me? Can everyone hear me? Okay. Um, can we put this a little higher? Yeah. Okay, is that better? Yeah. Nuclear fusion is the source that powers the sun and the stars. And scientists and engineers have long dreamed of constructing a nuclear fusion power device that would provide clean energy with no greenhouse gases and no pollution that would be safe with no chance of a meltdown and which would be cleaner than any, or cheaper than any other energy source. And the second part of this dream is that nuclear fusion could be the next giant leap in space propulsion, giving us capabilities far beyond those that we have today. Now, the government has been working on nuclear fusion power devices ever since the 1950s. But the government has, in recent years, been putting Mo most all of the fusion money going into two mega projects. And unfortunately, those mega projects have not been turning out well. The first mega project is the International Thermonuclear Experimental Reactor, or ITER. And that's a tokamak design. And you can get a feeling for the immense size of this reactor by this little person in the lower left-hand corner there. So it's really, really huge. Well, the initial testing for this device has slipped from 2016 to 2025. The first uh, full power operation has slipped from 2023 to 2035. And the cost has ballooned from $5 billion to $50 billion is the latest figure. And the problem is that tokamak devices have become so large and so complex that even if they, we eventually get them to work, they it's unlikely that they will be economical. So that's the major problem with the tokamak. Now this is mega project number two, the National Ignition Facility. And um, that's a totally different principle that's lasers blasting a pellet of fuel. And this is laser bay number one. There's also another huge room with laser bay number two. And there are other rooms in this facility too. So it's a very large facility. That uh, facility was finished seven years late in 2009. And by then, the cost had doubled to $5 billion. And it failed to reach its goal of ignition by 2012. And by ignition, we mean getting more energy output from the pellet of fuel than is input to the lasers. Now, unfortunately, it's still more than an order of magnitude away from the energy it needs to um, achieve ignition. So it's doubtful that this facility will ever live up to its name and achieve ignition. So why have the government programs failed? Well, one reason is that too much money has been spent on too few solutions, and in particular, uh, ever since about the 1970s, uh, most of the money for fusion research has been going into building bigger and bigger tokamaks. And meanwhile, there are other very promising devices that just haven't been explored because of lack of funding. And the mega projects that I just discussed have been floundering. Another problem is that most of the fusion research is done in university lab settings. And at university, uh, universities, the emphasis is on understanding the science and on writing scientific papers. 
and of course teaching the students how to do research. There's nothing wrong with all that, but it tends to uh, be very methodical type of research, and uh, it, it lends itself to very slow progress. And there's a tendency to avoid risk, because if they try a, an innovative solution and it doesn't work, then the whole device uh, may be canceled. So um, for, there are some, engineer, some entrepreneurs that have looked into um, this, and they've decided there must be a better way. So there are a whole bunch of small private companies that have started up that are trying to develop a nuclear fusion power device. And I've listed six of the companies here. There are a lot more of the companies, but these are the six that have been most in the news. And um, these companies are trying devices from the early days of fusion research that were never adequately explored, and they're also working on innovative new solutions. Three of these companies are very well funded. Uh, General Fusion uh, is getting funding from Jeff Bezos, who is the second richest person on Earth. And Trialpha Energy is getting funding from Paul Allen and other sources. Goldman and Sachs is another source. And um, Paul Allen is also a multi-billionaire. He was one of the founders of Microsoft. So, um, those are well-funded. Lockheed Martin effort at their Skunk Works is also well-funded. But unfortunately, the other three companies uh, have very good and promising ideas, but they're really struggling for funds. So why might a private company succeed where the government has failed? Well, private companies have a totally different culture. Uh, they spend less time on theory and writing scientific papers. They tend to be more practical. They iterate a lot more rapidly. And they explore various options while spending as little money as possible on each option. And they do not fear failure. And they often create breakthrough results where the government has failed. Just look at uh, SpaceX and reusable rockets. The government had many different programs to develop reusable rockets, and they all failed. So now I'm going to talk about LPP Fusion, which is one of the six private companies. And uh, I know more, much more about LPP Fusion. Uh, first of all, full disclosure, I have made a small investment in, in this company. And um, I've also been attending their, they have monthly conference calls for investors. I've been attending those. And since I have an engineering background, uh, and more recently, uh, uh, I've also been giving engineering uh, consulting uh, advice to the company. So um, their uh, device uh, is known as the dense plasma focus, or another name for it is focus fusion. And at the heart of their device are two electrodes. There's a cylindrical electrode in the center, that's the anode, and then these bars surrounding it are the, the cathode. Now, their device is using hydrogen and boron-11 fuel, and that's different than uh, most of the other fusion projects which use deuterium and tritium fuel. But the hydrogen and boron-11 actually has a number of important advantages. For one thing, it's very plentiful. There's essentially an infinite supply on the Earth. And because the fuel is so energy dense, you really actually need very little, bit, little of it. So the fuel costs will be pretty negligible. The fuel is aneutronic. That means it doesn't give off any neutrons. And because it's aneutronic, there's no radioactive waste which is a huge advantage. 
and is totally safe. There's no chance of a meltdown or any other serious accident. This uh, device exploits the fusion instabilities. Instead of trying to fight to overcome the instabilities as uh, the other fusion devices do. It's small. This picture is actually deceiving because it's a very close up picture, but the electrodes are actually only about this big. So it's, um, it's a very small device. And this is uh, what a commercial power. Uh, generator will look like. You can see how small it is compared to the, by comparing it with the adult there. And uh, this generator would produce five megawatts of power. Now that's enough to power about 4,000 <coughs> homes and it's enough to p power like an early settlement on the moon or on Mars. That would provide distributed power. So like in a big city, you'd have several of these spread out across the city to provide power for the city. And you'd have all the advantages of the distributed power versus the large centralized power plants that we have today. This device is inexpensive and it can be easily mass produced. And it would fit in a truck which is an advantage if there's a natural disaster, such as Hurricane Irma, and a power plant gets knocked out, you could just drive up in a truck with a new power plant. And it's small enough that it could fit in the size of rockets that we have today. Now, um, the way that Electricity has been generated ever since the time of Thomas Edison. Edison is that we first uh, burn a fuel and that produces heat. The heat produces steam. The steam turns a large turbine, such as the one shown in this picture. And then the turbine turns a generator. Well, the turbo machinery uh, is, is very expensive and uh, it requires a lot of maintenance. But with focused fusion, we can bypass that and do something else, which is called direct energy conversion. Now, um, with the direct energy conversion um, and the focused fusion device, the focused fusion device puts out a beam of charged particles with the positively charged ions going in one direction and the electrons uh, going in the other direction. But a beam of charged particles is electricity. That's what electricity is. So it's easy to capture that electricity with a high-tech performance uh, transformer device such as the one shown. So this, this chart shows the cost of different sources of electricity. And you can see from this chart, nuclear fission, uh, wind, and solar are much more expensive than uh, the fossil fuels, coal, and natural gas. But with the focus fusion device, because the fuel is so inexpensive and because you have direct energy conversion, it could be as much as one-tenth the cost of coal and natural, and natural gas. It's one of the very, very few uh, technologies on the horizon that, that could be this inexpensive. So um, there are three conditions that are needed for break-even, and I, I'm talking about uh, break-even using a neutronic fuel. Um, the first condition that's needed is that you need a hot enough temperature. And what you need is 1.8 billion degrees, which is 200 times hotter than the center of the sun. So uh, it's very, very hot. And uh, LPP fusion has achieved 2.5 billion degrees uh, temperature in their latest results. So they've met that condition and they've done very well there. 
the second condition that's needed is the confinement time. You need to confine your plasma to a very tight uh, ball called a plasmoid uh, for a long enough time for the fuel to burn. And it turns out it's a very short amount of time, only eight nanoseconds. Um, and they've achieved that goal also. They've uh, done 20 nanoseconds, which is two and a half times what is needed. So that one works fine, too. I should mention this is a pulsed uh, device. It would have about 200 pulses uh, per second. And the third condition uh, is density, and this is where they're lacking so far. They need to increase their density by a fa factor of 1,000, which is very challenging, uh, to be sure. But um, they have a plan on how to do that. And in fact, they're um, hoping to achieve break even within uh, approximately the next couple of years. So that's pending. But uh, hopefully, uh, they'll need a little bit of luck. But hopefully, they'll be able to do that. And if they do achieve break even, they would be ahead of everybody else. Because so far, no fusion device has succeeded in reaching break-even. So um, another promise of fusion is that it would be the next giant leap in space propulsion. Now, the, be the best parameter for measuring efficiency of uh, a rocket engine uh, is specific impulse. And the best chemical uh, rocket engines we have now have a specific impulse of 450 seconds. Nuclear thermal propulsion would have a specific impulse of 900 seconds. We don't have nuclear thermal rockets today, but there was work done back in the 1960s. So we know they are feasible, and many people are advocating developing them. We do have solar electric propulsion. And um, that's very low thrust propulsion. Uh, and the best uh, that we have today is like state-of-the-art hall thrusters with about 4,200 seconds uh, specific impulse. Well, a neutronic fusion would have a specific impulse of 1,200,000 seconds. It's orders of magnitude better than anything we have today. And I, I can't emphasize enough how much a step change that would be. That, that would be like going from the sailing ships at the time of Columbus to the ocean liners that we have today. So what missions might be enabled if we had fusion? Well, first, uh, we could have a human mission to Mars that would go from Earth to Mars in only approximately two weeks. We could have human missions to explore the moons of the outer planets, such as Jupiter, Saturn, and beyond. We could have a reusable single stage to orbit launch vehicle with, that would still carry a significant payload. And theoretically, with a multi-stage uh, uh, fusion rocket, we could travel up to one-third the speed of light. Now, that, that's not exactly warp drive, but it's where you start thinking of interstellar travel, uh, at least for robotic probes. So in order to get fusion to work, policy changes are needed. And the thing that's needed most is actually just more funding for fusion research. In federal year 2016, the budget in our country for fusion research was $438 million. Now, that's only slightly more than one hundredth of 1% of the federal spending. So it's, it's really a very minuscule percentage of, of our federal budget. Now, right now, 
private companies are getting almost none of that money, uh, which is a problem. Um, and uh, r they really need uh, to get some of the government funding. And um, it's not, we, we really need to give several different private companies uh, some of that funding because it's impossible right now to, to know which of the companies would produce the needed breakthrough. And we don't really need to give the private companies a big percentage of, of the fusion budget. You know, I'd be happy if they got 10% of the fusion budget because a little bit of money goes a long way with these private companies. They, they just spend much their money a lot more efficient, efficiently than the government does. So uh, in conclusion, uh, we need nuclear fusion to solve the world's energy needs and also to be a big advance in space propulsion. Private industry may lead the way to the first practical fusion device, but policy change is essential in order to get this to happen. Uh, fusion is, is viewed by many as uh, an impossible dream, but at one point in time we thought airplanes were an impossible dream and landing humans on the moon was an impossible dream. So um, fusion, I believe, will become a reality someday and I'm actually optimistic that it'll be sooner than most people think and it's the private companies that uh, is giving me that optimism. So uh, that's the end of my talk. Um, I, I do uh, have some fact sheets on LPV Fusion. If any of you are interested in learning more about that company, uh, please see me afterwards and I'll give you a fact sheet about the company. And I'll be glad to answer any questions. Yeah, right here. Well, um, it, it depends whether it's like space propulsion in deep space or whether it's uh, like a launch vehicle from the Earth. Uh, when I showed the 1,200,000 seconds specific impulse, uh, that type of thrust is simply from that beam of ions that uh, that, that device would be emitting and it's very low thrust propulsion. Now, if, if you were using, um, uh, if you're using fusion for a launch vehicle from the Earth, the, the design of your rocket engine would be a lot different. Yeah, just commenting on that question. Uh, the phrase that you failed to use is magnetic nozzle. The reason that a neutronic fusion is so exciting for space propulsion is that the reaction products are charged particles. Uh, charged particles can be shaped and directed by magnetic fields, and specifically you can direct them to go backwards as rapid propulsion threats. So the perfect fusion rocket would be a neutronic fusion uh, because you can use magnetic nozzles and turn it into a, a practical rocket. Other types of fusion, you can still make rockets out of it, but it's not quite as efficient. So Thank you. For, sorry for stepping on here. Thank you. No, that's good. What's the mass of that fusion, that reactor? Uh, it's, it's pretty light. The, the electrodes are, are rather light, uh, and you need a vacuum chamber surrounding the electrodes, but um, I don't know. I, I, but it, 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 so it's in the low would, tons. I mean, if you wait till you're in orbit to turn it on, then you naturally get a vacuum. Well, you don't. Right, but you don't have to wait till you're in orbit to turn it on. It's safe to launch from Earth because there's uh, no radioactive waste. Okay. Um, so, so if it if it if it uh, fails somehow and explodes or something, you don't have to worry about it. 
Yeah, over what here. Is the and the what? What's the what? The oh. the okay. Uh, what what happens? Um, the hydrogen and the boron eleven fuse together. For an instant, they uh, make carbon twelve, but the carbon twelve at those temperatures is unstable. So it uh, immediately uh, breaks off into three alpha particles, which are helium nuclei. So. Uh, Later, we, we had one of the six uh, companies is called Tri Alpha Energy. Uh, it's called Tri Alpha because of the three alpha particles. They, they also are planning to use the hydrogen and boron 11 fuel. Question here? Well, recently, there was an that the helium 3 is, is another type of fusion fuel. Um, the uh, helium-3 is sort of middle ground between uh, the hydrogen boron-11 and the deuterium-tritium. Um, the problem with helium-3 is that it's very rare on the Earth, but it's, it's more plentiful on the Moon. You can uh, extract it from the lunar regolith. So um, some people have, have advocated mining the moon for helium-3 for use in fusion reactors on the Earth. Now, the, the problem there, in, in my opinion, is if you have to mine it on, from the moon, is it going to be economic? Well, we really need something that's economical. And uh, with the hydrogen and boron-11, that's you know, plentiful right here on the Earth. It, it would certainly be economical. Over here? Uh, yes. Uh and perhaps defend uh, LPP fusion's approach to plasma instabilities? Uh, well, their, their approach is very radical. You know, it is very, very radical. They depend on the instabilities. They want the instabilities. When will we know if that radical approach works? Uh, well, th they're hoping to achieve break even within a couple of years. They, they actually have a plan to do that. They're being very optimistic, I think. Uh, I, I, I'll be happy if they succeed within 10 years, <laughs> actually. But um, it, it is a totally different approach. And it, it, the instabilities have been uh, the bane of the fusion reactors over the years. And uh, what's happened with the tokamaks, um, there are several modes of instabilities. And every time they go up to a new energy level, they run into a new type of instability. And it, it, their machine keeps growing and growing in size uh, because of the instabilities. So. I'm going to go ahead and cut the questions off there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.